Karate friends, welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we will be exploring a very grim but interesting topic by reading some passages from some ancient Roman agricultural manuals that gave their audience tips and tricks on how to be a good slave owner and manager. So let's check that out. Slavery in the ancient world is a fascinating topic and much has been written about it, so I'm focusing the scope pretty narrowly for this video. But before we do that, I do want to give you a little bit of context and information about slavery generally. So slavery in the ancient world was extremely common, it was all over the place, and no one really questioned it. There weren't any abolitionists, as far as we know, of running around saying slavery is evil. Everybody pretty much accepted that it's just, it's not a pleasant part of life, but it's a part of life and it's fine. Slavery was also not racially based, so you you could be any race, any nationality, and even any class. You could be pretty high class, but if you lose a war or if you go too far into debt, you can still become a slave. That's still a possibility for anyone in the ancient world. So that's something that everybody <laughs> was a little nervous and cognizant of. And within slavery, there were many different classes. So if you're a tutor for a really aristocratic, wealthy family, then you still have pretty high status, a comfortable lifestyle. You may get a stipend. So you could be living pretty high on the hog even as a slave, which is strange, but then there are different ranks below you. So you could be a potter, right? A workman, a skilled workman, or you could be just a day laborer where you're a miner or something. And at that level, your life is really hard. So there's all kinds of different ways to be a slave in the ancient world, which is interesting. So uh, slavery was a very big part of everyone's lives and of the economy, and you see it popping up everywhere. For example, there's a very popular genre in Roman literature that has to do with how to manage a farm, how to manage land, which is strange, but it was very aristocratic, or it was seen as very aristocratic to manage land to be a farmer. If you were from a noble family, one of the only acceptable or cool ways to earn your money was through land management. Obviously, the aristocrats weren't actually plowing their land, but they were supposed to know something about how plowing works so that they could manage other people who were doing the plowing. So uh, these manuals go into all kinds of details about how to grow vines, how to grow cucumbers, etc. And most of them have a passage, sometimes multiple passages, on how to manage the slaves that are actually doing all of this work. So the first example comes from Cato, who generally is one of my favorite characters from ancient Roman history. He's just this extremely grumpy, conservative, holier-than-thou Roman politician. He's adorable and I love him. But he wrote this book, De Agricultura, about agriculture, where he goes into all kinds of details about cabbages and all these fun things. But he also has some extremely brutal passages on slavery. For example, look over the livestock and hold a sale. Sell your oil if the price is satisfactory, and sell the surplus of your wine and grain. Sell worn-out oxen, blemish cattle, blemish sheep, wool, hides, an old wagon, old tools, an old slave, a sickly slave, and whatever else is superfluous. The master should have the selling habit, not the buying habit. So obviously that's pretty brutal, talking about humans as if they're worn out equipment. The rest of the quotes for this video are going to come from Columella, who wrote De Re Rustica, or about country affairs is roughly how that translates. And he has some very interesting passages as well. This first one is about living arrangements for your slaves, how you should set that up. It will be best that cubicles for unfettered slaves be built to admit the midday sun at the equinox. For those who are in chains, there should be an underground prison, as wholesome as possible, receiving light through a number of narrow windows built so high from the ground that they cannot be reached by the hand. So that's a real strange juxtaposition of two things. On the one hand, make sure they have lots of natural light and windows and that the environment is as wholesome as possible. And on the other hand, make sure that they're in chains and in a dungeon. Next, again, there are many levels to slavery and Columella is very interested in the level of the overseer or the manager of your farm. Uh, that position is key. If that person stinks, then the whole operation is going to stink and it's not going to be very profitable. So he goes on for pages detailing how to pick the perfect overseer and all of his qualifications. But at the end of that, he has this passage where he says, be the overseer what he may, he should be given a woman companion to keep him within bounds, and yet in certain matters to be a help to him. 
So again, it's just sort of a strange juxtaposition of, on the one hand, be nice to your overseer and reward him, and on the other hand, give him a woman as if she's just a cow or a rug or a piece of furniture, you know? Furthermore, he says of the overseer that he should be not only skilled in the tasks of husbandry or agriculture, but should also be endowed as far as the servile disposition allows, uh, with such qualities of feeling that he may exercise authority without laxness and without cruelty, and always humor some of the better hands, at the same time being forbearing even with those of lesser worth, so that they may rather fear his sternness than detest his cruelty. This he can accomplish if he will choose rather to guard his subordinates from wrongdoing than to bring upon himself through his negligence the necessity of punishing offenders. So that is sort of a strange passage as well, Columella giving advice on how an overseer should discipline the other slaves, and perhaps surprisingly, he doesn't say that you should just beat them all the time. <laughs> He's not an advocate of that. He says more you want to use encouragement and rewards and deterrence rather than uh, violent punishments after they've already committed the offense. So I find that pretty interesting. Columella also has some surprisingly good insight into the fact that slaves, especially these day laborers who are working a farm, are at the bottom of the social ladder and therefore are constantly getting screwed and done wrong by everybody above them. And he says, In fact, I now and then avenge those who have just cause for grievance, as well as punish those who incite the slaves to revolt or who slander their taskmasters, and on the other hand, I reward those who conduct themselves with energy and diligence. He also says, And the investigation of the householders should be the more painstaking in the interest of slaves of this sort, that they may not be treated unjustly in the matter of clothing or other allowances, inasmuch as being liable to a greater number of people, such as overseers, taskmasters, and jailers, they are the more liable to unjust punishment. And again, when smarting under cruelty and greed, they are more to be feared. So he does give himself away a little bit at the end there. He's clearly not saying you should pursue justice for your slaves because it's the right thing to do, but because if they have no food, no justice, if they have nothing to lose, then obviously they're going to revolt and he's afraid of that. He does generally advise treating your slaves well and giving them rewards, so he says you should inspect them, make sure their barracks are in good condition, make sure their clothes are in good condition. Not pretty, we don't care if they're ugly, but you want to make sure they are weatherproof and they can keep them warm and dry. Although again, I'm pretty sure that's self-serving because he wants them to be able to work in whatever weather to get more work done. He also has a strange little passage where he says if a woman has had more than two sons, you should relieve her of work detail. She doesn't have to work in the fields anymore more, which makes sense. She's got a handful with those two sons. But then when she has had three or more sons, you should set her free. You should give her her freedom, which I'm not sure what the thought process there is because it's not like women can choose to have three sons or work harder to have three sons. It's kind of arbitrary. It's not really up to you, but um, whatever. I'm sure they were glad to have their freedom, so I'm not going to complain. Finally, there is what I thought was a very cringy passage where he talks about how you should be chummy with your slaves and joke around with them. So he says, I perceived that their unending toil was lightened by such friendliness. I would even jest with them at times and allow them also to jest more freely. Nowadays, I make it a practice to call them into consultation on any new work as if they were more experienced, and to discover by this means what sort of ability is possessed by each of them and how intelligent he is. Furthermore, I observe that they are more willing to set about a piece of work on which they think that their opinions have been asked and their advice followed. So again, just very cringy and manipulative, and I just felt so much disgust at this passage in particular, although it's certainly not the most egregious thing we have looked at today. Uh, but I hope that you found this video interesting. Thank you so much for checking it out. Special thank you to subscribers and to Patreon members. I hope to see all of you again next week. Karate.